Good morning and good afternoon. Thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, we're excited to welcome you to Coalition's monthly security webinar series. Um, my name is Jen and I'm gonna be moderating the conversation today. And I'm excited to be joined by my colleague, Aaron Kraus, who leads security engagement for Coalition. Aaron is an information security expert and educator and at Coalition, he is responsible for partnering with our brokers and policyholders to uh, provide more education and expertise on security topics. And today we're excited to dive into the importance of data backups. Uh, for those of you who've participated in any of our recent webinars, you know, you'll hear the theme recurring that data management, data storage, data hygiene has become critically important, particularly with the rise of ransomware attacks where uh, threat actors will exfiltrate data and, and compromise data backups. And so Aaron's gonna be talking a little bit more today about some of our, our best practices for data backups and how you can best uh, integrate a, a data security program as part of your overall security program at your organization. So first, just to kick off a quick note on Zoom, I think we're probably all far too used to Zoom at this point, but you should see two icons at the bottom of your screen. One is a chat icon and one is a Q&A feature. And we would welcome you to provide questions throughout the presentation and we'll be taking questions uh, throughout and also have some dedicated time at the end for Q&A. So we'd welcome anything that comes up as we go through these slides. So today's agenda, uh, first, let's talk a little bit about Coalition. We're excited to be welcomed by a broad group of our broker and policyholder partners today. Uh, we're the fastest growing provider of cyber insurance in the US and Canada. And as we'll hope to highlight in today's presentation, we take a very unique approach to cyber risk management in that we help our partners think about how to prevent and, and be proactively thinking about risk management in addition to providing insurance and uh, mitigation after an event should happen. And we're fortunate to have financial backing from uh, the world's leading reinsurers, which you can see at the bottom of the screen there. We're gonna cover a couple of different topics in today's session. So first, Aaron is gonna talk about what is a data backup and why does it matter? He's gonna also talk about what you should back up and sort of best practices for how to maintain good uh, routine data backups provide some specific technical recommendations, and then we'll finish up at the end with some Q&A. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Aaron. Well, thank you, Jen. And good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. If you've attended one of these webinars in the past, you may be noticing a theme. We often talk about the Coalition Cybersecurity Guide, this document that we created with a top 10 list of cyber best practices, good cyber hygiene practices, things that you really should be doing for cybersecurity. Surprise, surprise, data backups are one of those top 10 items. So we're reinforcing some of the details there, uh, rather reinforcing the concept there, but also providing more details. So uh, instead of just a one page talking about the importance of backups, today we're actually going to look at what is the strategy that you should use for approaching backups? How does it fit into an overall security program, which should be comprised of at least some, if not all of the 10 things that appear in the cybersecurity guide. If you have any questions about that, we will have a link at the end that shows you where you can get a copy of the cybersecurity guide and future webinars looking into a crystal ball here. We'll continue to cover some of these topics to give you a little bit more detail, color and nuance around how to actually go about implementing these. I like to start off with a question. I like to figure out why is this important? Why is this something that I should care about as a business owner, as a leader of a business, as someone in charge of some type of data, some type of systems that people are using? So what is a backup? Why should you care about it? I'm gonna do something that will make many of my English teachers roll over in their graves, which is start with a definition straight from the dictionary. A backup, noun, it means help, support, assistance, aid, something that is kept in reserve or reinforcements that can be called up when needed, additional resources that are available in a time of need. So this is a practice that we're putting in place to address an incident that occurs. You get hit by ransomware, you have some sort of issue, 
which causes your primary systems, your primary data to no longer be available. You can no longer access the data. It's become corrupted. Something is physically destroyed. Basically, these are things that you have waiting if and when you should need them. It can be a little bit difficult sometimes to get your brain around that because we're talking about a potential event, not necessarily something that you need every day, but as anyone who, like me, wrote term papers using Microsoft Word in the early days where it often crashed and you would lose hours worth of work because you had forgotten to hit save, you did not have it backed up and ready to go. You know that sinking feeling that you experience when all of a sudden, hey, you needed that data and it's no longer available. So what we're really talking about here is mitigating the risk of that data loss. So let's dive in a little more detail. What is a data backup? Intentionally broad definition here, a data backup is just a copy of any vital system data. Very broad definition here, that could include the data that you are loading into, processing, or storing in applications. If you are an organization that develops your own applications, it might also be the custom software code that you've created, especially if that is the purpose of your business. If you are selling that software to other businesses, that's obviously a vital asset. Having it backed up is going to be a critical concern. Broadening the definition here, the two items uh, on the bottom of this, this sub-bullet, computer operating systems or definition files, not necessarily data that we might think of in a traditional sense. You know, you type numbers into a spreadsheet, you build a database of customer contacts. These are more infrastructure data that is actually needed to make all of those other systems work. So in order to run applications, you need to have a computer with an operating system. In the cloud, we use what are called definition files to specify the cloud infrastructure that we're going to use for the information systems that are vital to our business. So having a backup copy of those in case something goes wrong, in case a server is destroyed, in case your cloud service provider has a glitch or an outage, having backups of those things allow you to recreate the system environments that you need, and then also reload the data that you might need. I get asked this question pretty frequently, which is better, an automatic or a manual backup? And the answer, putting on my best auditor hat is, as always, it depends. Automatic backups obviously have some advantages. They run automatically. You don't have to think about them. They can take care of stuff without any human intervention. People's calendars get crazy. They may be out on vacation. An automatic backup will still run even if that's the case. However, there are also situations where an automatic backup can almost give you a false sense of security. You think you've scheduled a backup. You think you have a backup system in place. But as your business grows, as it changes, you need to make sure that that automated backup routine is also updated. Coalition has unfortunately seen this in some of the claims that have, uh, that have been reported to us, an automated backup routine was in place, but a particular folder on a drive or a particular system was not included in the backup routine. It was put in place after the backup routine was created. The backup was never updated to include that system. There are also situations, and we'll talk a little bit more about software as a service or SaaS applications, Generally, you don't have to worry about backing up data. If you're putting it into salesforce.com, into QuickBooks, those service providers actually offer data backup as one of the features of the SaaS application. It's part of the value that you get in offloading the management of the application to another party. I tend to be a little bit paranoid. I work in security. I work in risk management. It's an obvious, obvious part of my job. So even if I'm using one of those applications, I may still occasionally do a manual backup, maybe once a year, export all of the data into a spreadsheet, export all of the data into a separate database and keep a backup copy there. So again, the answer is which one's better. It's going to depend on what your business operations actually look like, what types of data you are processing and where you're actually storing or processing that data. Answering the second question, why should you care about backups? Well, I will answer that question with another question. What, what would happen to your business? What would happen to your organization if you suffer a fat finger issue? Somebody types the wrong information into a spreadsheet or into a database. Uh, a physical device or a copy of your data is stolen or suffers physical destruction. Pipes burst, fires occur. What happens if you get hit by ransomware? 
bad guys get into your network, they lock up all your files with encryption, they charge you for a key. It may be more money than you have, it may be a currency that you don't have access to. Frighteningly enough, many ransomware gangs, I guess not frighteningly, but pretty predictably, these are the bad guys. They don't really care about customer service. There have been instances of ransomware where even if you pay the ransom, you get a decryption key. The decryption key either doesn't work or it only works part way. It does not give you back access to everything that was encrypted. Surprise, surprise, there's no customer support for these ransomware gangs. They don't take phone calls about the quality of their product. They don't refund you your money if the product doesn't work as intended. They've made off with their Bitcoin. That's all they care about. Final question here, what happens if your data just suffers from some sort of random transient incident? We may call these computer glitches. Some people may believe there are gremlins in the system. There may also just be general disruptions. There are things like hardware failure, random freak occurrences that can cause systems to either be destroyed, cause the data on them to become corrupted. Answering this question of what happens if any one of these things were to occur, this is where backups come in handy. This is where backups can help to prevent an incident from basically being game over for your organization. A good backup should mean that a security incident affecting data does not cause your business, does not cause your organization to be down forever, should be recoverable. Jen, I see we have a couple of Q and A's. If anything comes up that you think would logically, since I can't seem to get the Q and A window to open, uh, if anything comes up that would be a good stopping point in the middle rather than uh, wait for the end, please just let me know. Yeah, I was actually gonna interrupt with one question that came in about uh, about cloud storage. We had one person ask about using G Suite uh, or other cloud storage. Is this automatically backup or is this, is, something, is this something where people should have additional backup procedures beyond the cloud storage? Great question. We're actually gonna talk about that a little bit later. Uh, the answer again will be, it depends what you're putting in there. Those services offer something known as data durability, uh, which we'll define later. Basically, it is similar to backups. Uh, it just depends on how much you trust Google to never, never potentially lose your data. It may also depend on if your organization ever forgets to pay bills. If you forget to pay one of your cloud service providers, they turn off your access and delete data. In that case, a backup copy might be useful. We're going to turn our attention now to what makes a good backup. I'm using a qualifier here, so I will define that term. A good backup is one that displays these four critical elements. The backups should have verified integrity as well as coverage. Integrity meaning the backup data should actually be usable. Unfortunately, Coalition has also seen this in some of our insurance claims. Data has been backed up, but for some reason the data is not in a usable format. The data has become corrupted as part of the backup process. Basically, the backups are not usable. In that case, the incident does cause a serious disruption. Coverage speaks to that point that I was talking about where the business needs to make sure the backup is truly backing up all of the vital systems and data. If you only back up some of your servers, but it turns out that vital, uh, vital organization data also lives on users' laptops, those laptops need to be covered by your backup plan. Your backups should occur on a defined schedule as well. You need to have current copies of data in a backup. Current obviously is a somewhat flexible definition. An organization that processes 10,000 customer orders a day is going to have a very different definition of current than let's say a tax preparation firm where there's a spike in new data created right around tax preparation time. The rest of the year, you may create a lower volume of data. So backup schedules for those organizations will of course look different. We're going to talk about the difference between online, offline, and on-site, off-site. Very nuanced and academic. Basically, key takeaway is that a backup should be stored, and I've put this in quotes, offline from the primary system. We'll talk about that in more detail on a later slide. And last but not least, your backups should be recoverable within an organization-defined expected time frame. If you need to be back up and running, Within an hour of an incident knocking out your primary system, your backup schedule, your backup strategy needs to support that recovery objective. So what do all of these things mean? 
More terms here thrown at you in the Wizard of Oz style, versions, archives, and backups. What are the differences between these? You may hear some of these terms. Do they mean the same thing as a backup? Do they mean something different? Do you need to do any extra work to define your backup strategy if you have one of these things available? Terms like version history, revisions, snapshots, often used to talk about backup copies of data. These are usually going to be stored on the same system that they are backing up. So we talk about the primary system, your main database, if you take a snapshot of that, if you have virtual machines, many of the virtual machine platforms support snapshots, those are often stored on the same system. Some advantages and disadvantages we'll talk about a little bit later. Obvious one big disadvantage, if there is physical destruction of a computer system, any of the backup data, as well as the primary data stored on that system, they're both not going to be recoverable. Version history revisions and snapshots are often also recoverable by end users. They don't require any intervention by IT. Q, uh, question that came in in the Q&A, if you're using something like G Suite, Microsoft Office 365, you may be familiar with the version history features that those document collaboration tools offer. If somebody has incorrectly entered data, if somebody has messed up a document, you can always roll back to a previous version. So these types of backups, version histories, revisions, and snapshots often are useful for reversing issues that impacted the integrity of data. If somebody entered all the wrong information in a spreadsheet, completely threw off the calculations, you can always roll back to the last previously saved version where all of the calculations were correct and redo the data entry. If somebody moved around graphics or messed around with your slides, you don't like the way they laid them out, you can always roll back to the previous version that you saved. Traditional data backups as well as archives are a slightly different flavor of data backups. These are typically going to be stored off system as well as off site. So you're going to make a copy of the data and then physically remove it somehow, either putting it onto a tape drive or a hard drive, which is shipped off to a separate location. These may also be done as network backups. You make a copy of data at night when users are not actively using the system and mirror that data to another data center, an offsite storage facility. These are typically more complex. One piece of that complexity is that recovering from them typically is going to require a member of IT or a recovery specialist to actually physically assist in the recovery process. If you have data being pulled out of archives, you may need to go through an archivist. If you have a backup solution that includes data stored offsite, you may actually need to get that offsite storage provider to physically pull your backup media and ship it to you in order to restore from it. These, yes, are more complex, but they are also more complete. They can be useful for recovering data that has been corrupted, so integrity issues, or data that has been entirely destroyed. Unlike a version history of a document stored on the same system of that, as that document, if there's physical destruction of that system, you've lost both the primary and the backup copy. If you're pulling data from an archive that is physically stored somewhere else, obviously destruction of the primary doesn't affect the backup in any way. Continuing our Wizard of Oz theme, versions, backups, and archives. Oh my, which one of these should we choose? Where should we store them? This is part of building your strategy, figuring out what types of risks your organization might face. You're going to choose one or more of these building blocks to build your backup strategy. Online versus offline really describes where backups are stored relative to the backup target or the primary system. For example, do you make a copy of data and store it on a separate hard drive within the same server, or do you make a copy of data, put it onto a separate hard drive, and then physically ship that hard drive to an offsite storage facility? When we talk about protecting against ransomware, offline storage is essential. Many of the ransomware programs specifically look on a network for anything that might be a data storage device, file shares network servers that have databases on them. Those are primary targets for ransomware, as well as the servers and workstations that people use on a daily basis. If it's not attached to your network, if it is not stored on the same system, obviously the ransomware can't find it. Similar, but slightly different, on-site versus off-site backups. An on-site backup is stored in the same physical facility. 
So if you have a data center, let's say, or a server room in your main office, you may do a backup of data. You may take that information, put it onto a physical hard drive, move that hard drive to a separate location within the same facility. This can be useful in terms of speed of recovery. You just have to walk down the hall to uh, the storage, storage room, pull that backup hard drive. But of course, if a fire destroys that entire facility, both your primary as well as your backup are going to be destroyed. Offsite backup stored in a different physical facility. There are actually offsite storage providers. You may be familiar with some of them. Iron Mountain is a good example. You can actually put tape drives or hard drives into physically locked boxes. One of these providers comes and picks them up, takes the box to their storage facility, which is highly secured, dedicated to storing media. The advantage here is if your primary facility is destroyed, obviously those backup tapes that are stored possibly in another state or even in another country, they're not going to be impacted. The downside of course is those things are going to be slower to recover. You have to request your backup media be returned to you. And then of course it has to go through the logistics of being loaded onto a truck, being loaded onto a plane or some other transportation and actually returned to you. Final item here are the online backup tools. And this is where it can get particularly confusing. Online backup tools really just de defined as any online software that lets you store information in a provider's cloud environment. We're gonna talk about some of these when we look at the recommendations. Despite the fact that they have online in their name, these tools can actually be great to implement an automated offline and offsite backup strategy. Many of them offer a software agent, a little application that you install on your servers, on your laptops or your desktops. They run an automated backup job. They pull all of the relevant data and copy it to a cloud storage environment. That cloud storage environment is not connected to your network. It's obviously offsite and offline, physically separated and a completely different system. Even though it's called an online storage, uh, online backup tool, these things offer offline offsite storage. Aaron, we had a question in about the issue of um, offsite storage. And the individual is asking, you know, they have a client who says they have offsite storage and it's backed up regularly. Do they face any risks in that scenario if they're using an offsite, um, an automated backup strategy? There could be risks there. Uh, might need a little bit more detail on that one to answer it. I think the primary risk that at least I've encountered in my career is handing over your data to someone else. That can cause some concerns. Typical strategies there uh, include most of the storage providers. I know Iron Mountain just because I've worked with them. They actually give you locked boxes that you load yourself. You put all of your backup tapes or backup drives, and then you actually control the keys to open those boxes. You can also encrypt the data before it gets stored on the drives. You hold the encryption keys. So even if somebody unlocks the box, pops the hard drive into a computer, they can't actually read any of the data if they don't have access to that encryption key. From a physical security standpoint, one of the things, I was gonna talk about this a little bit later, but it's a great question. There are some legal and regulatory obligations where you may have to have an offsite backup location that is physically or geographically separated. So if a natural disaster impacts your primary facility, your offsite backup facility should be far enough away that it is not impacted by that, uh, by that same disaster. If you have not considered that as part of your planning, that could also be a risk. If your backup facility is you know, 10 miles away or 15 kilometers away, a natural disaster like a wildfire, earthquake, or hurricane is likely going to impact both facilities. And on that point too, we actually saw a major event last month where a, a data center burned down. And in a scenario like that, if, if you were using that facility for your offline backups, there, that could be you know, significant compromise of your offsite data storage. Exactly. And hopefully anybody who's using that data center as a primary had a backup that was far enough away, it was not impacted or possibly provided by another data center provider. If anyone was using that as a backup, 
provider, obviously they need to choose a new one. So for a little while, they're working at increased risk of not having a valid backup until they can stand up a replacement. Another question came in about online backup service providers and, and what should customers expect the average restoration timeline to look like if they're using an online backup service? Most of these are instantaneous with two caveats and those are actually something that you control the speed of your network connection as well as the ability for you to stand up replacement physical infrastructure if needed. So if you have an online backup, you have a laptop stolen, the primary factors in how fast you can recover that data, how fast can you get a replacement laptop, and then how fast is your network connectivity to actually pull all of that data back down. Great questions. We're actually going to get to, to talk more about that when we look at the recommendations. So I'll bookmark that for now, uh, but happy to come back to it if needed. Another important question to answer when designing your backup strategy is what should you be backing up? What are the targets of backup? A little bit cheeky here, but honestly, you don't need to back up everything that you use. There are certain things that either are not valuable enough or that can be restored. Uh, I've seen overly ambitious backup strategies where you try to back up too much and then the cost of backup or the, the actual speed becomes a limiting factor because you're backing up so much data, it takes a long time. I've sorted this into two columns, definitely and maybe. The maybe is where you need to make a decision. If it makes sense, back it up. If not, you may be able to live without a backup. On the definite side, any critical business data, you should have some form of backup. Wherever it's stored, whatever format it's in, you should be able to say definitively, yes, I do have at least one backup copy of this data that I could use in the event of an emergency. You may also have regulated data, which is not necessarily critical to your business, but is required to be stored or archived or backed up for a specific period of time. Good examples of this, if you are a healthcare organization or dealing with healthcare information in the US, HIPAA does require that certain types of data be maintained for either six or seven years, depending on the type of data. Your backup strategy can actually help you meet that, uh, meet that goal. Any systems that you build or maintain, if they are critical to the operations of your business, you should have the ability to restore those. In order to restore them, obviously you need to have stuff backed up. Same thing for any applications that you build with the caveat that typically software as a service applications, stuff like Microsoft OneDrive, Google Drive, Salesforce.com, you typically don't make backup copies of those applications. However, kicking over into the maybe column, it might not be a bad idea to do a backup of the data that you have in those SaaS applications. Depending on the type of data, this could be as simple as making a copy of the files that are stored, let's say in Dropbox, Microsoft OneDrive or Google Drive. It could also be a spreadsheet export or a CSV export of whatever data you've stored in a SaaS application like salesforce.com. And this is where that automated versus manual backup question pops up. Again, I'm paranoid. I wear my tinfoil hat with pride. I don't trust that I will always have access to the data in these tools. I don't necessarily need to back up the data in Salesforce on a, a weekly basis. Salesforce has a long track record of providing quality service. But once a year, I am going to do a spreadsheet export of all the data in there, just on the off chance that something ever goes wrong in the future. I personally use Apple's ecosystem. So iCloud is one of my primary cloud storage locations. I have a reminder on my calendar every six months to go and back up some critical files that I store in iCloud. I've never had a, an issue with them. I've never had a problem, but just on the off chance, I forget to pay for my extra iCloud storage or Apple suffers some kind of major outage. I at least have a backup copy that is no more than six months old at my disposal. Some other potential targets for backing up should include user workstations and mobile devices. We often focus very heavily on backing up servers. Depending on your organization, mobile devices, workstations like laptops or desktops may also contain sensitive information. We're gonna talk about some backup providers and recommendations. So how you actually go about that, 
might look a little bit different than architecting a backup strategy for SaaS applications, but definitely a target worth considering, as well as any data that you have sourced from outside the organization. If you are what's known as a system of record, you are the definitive source of information, chances are you're gonna be the one who needs to own that backup. If you pull publicly available data and use that for some purposes, maybe mailing addresses, might be contact information, it might be worth backing up. It might also be something that in the event you have, uh, you suffer a security incident, it might actually be cheaper just to pull a new copy of the data or to reconstitute it from the data sources that you originally used. So making sure you have a good inventory and understand where your data came from is important. Final thought on designing your backup strategy should be accurately measuring the cadence or the schedule that you need to implement for performing backups. And there are two key metrics that you can use here, RTO, recovery time objective, and RPO, the recovery point objective. If you have done a business continuity planning exercise, business continuity and disaster recovery, BCDR, continuity of operations, all similar terms. If you've done one of these exercises, chances are you've identified some of these metrics. The RTO or recovery time objective is simply how fast do you need to recover? If you suffer an incident, if the system goes down, how quickly do you need it to come back online? I know many small businesses that have something like QuickBooks, but they can always do business manually by issuing invoices that they generated in Microsoft Word and they have access to their banking details. They can live without QuickBooks for a couple of days or a couple of weeks at the most. Maybe they only need it, uh, they only absolutely must have it for quarter end close. Your recovery time objective there is gonna be pretty, uh, pretty loose. If you are an online ordering platform, your recovery time objective is going to be very tight. You wanna get back up and running in a short period of time so that your customers can continue placing orders. Recovery point objective describes how much data you can afford to lose in the event of a disruption. And this can be measured in time. It can also be measured in the number of transactions, number of orders, whatever sort of unit of work your business does. Recovery point objectives are often set to hours. For example, in the event of a system disruption, I can afford to lose 24 hours worth of data. That's obviously going to give me some information I need to plan my backup strategy. If I can't afford to lose more than 24 hours of data, only doing a weekly backup is not going to be sufficient. If I back up on Sunday and have an incident on Friday, I've just lost five days worth of data. I have breached that objective that I set for my recovery point. I need to make sure I'm doing a daily backup to meet that target. To the earlier question about online backups and how fast you can recover from them, I think a great, great point of planning here. Recovery time objective. If I need a particular server to be up and running within an hour of an outage, I may not have time to wait for a replacement to be delivered. In that case, my backup strategy is going to be online backup with sufficient network capacity to pull all the data back down within an hour. And I may also need to have a spare component, spare part, totally redundant system available to go in the event of a disaster rather than waiting for a new one to be shipped. Final note here, and it's included on this slide because it's often expressed in terms of 99.9 .9 something is data durability. This is a feature in cloud services very complicated definition. It is the long-term protection of quality data. To put that into plain English, data durability describes what you should expect if you put a file into Dropbox, into Google Drive, into Microsoft OneDrive. What percent of the time should you expect to be able to recover that file in its original state? When you double click something in Dropbox, 99.999% of the time it will open, no problems, the data is available and the file has not become corrupted in any way. To the earlier question, these major cloud platforms offer data backups. They have multiple copies of data so that even if they have a hard drive failure, even if one of their data centers burns down, the data that customers have put into these services is not lost. And that is described in this metric known as data durability. 
To the point I made about being paranoid, I think a periodic backup might not be a bad idea, even if you have a durability SLA or service level agreement, service level agreement rather, just in case the provider happens to have a prolonged outage or some type of freak data corruption does occur. Aaron, we got in a question on this topic specifically uh, of data durability, which is if an organization is using a backup provider that has version control mechanisms, uh, does that help avoid the, the risk of ransomware attacks or of losing data in a ransomware attack? It can, as long as the backup is properly isolated. And by that, I mean, if a user's workstation falls victim to ransomware, one of the things that the ransomware program will try to do is find other places that the data is stored. So obviously local files, stuff that's stored on your hard drive will be encrypted. Anything that's in a cloud service usually is not going to be reachable by the ransomware. So you should be good to go there. Things like Microsoft OneDrive and Google Drive are a great, great example of that. Those files, because they have backups and versions available, even if a Word document stored in Microsoft OneDrive that a user has on their desktop, even if that is ransomed, the backup copies are still safe because they don't have the ability to access those revisions or version history that are stored in, in the Microsoft Cloud. And I guess I'll add to that that we have definitely seen a trend in uh, insurance claims or in, in ransomware attacks where on-site backups, if they are connected at all to the main network, as Aaron was just saying, will oftentimes be encrypted. So it does sort of reinforce the, uh, the need to consider off-site backups uh, and, and online backups so that they're protected and segmented from the core network. And that can sound very intimidating to put it into more small business terms. I was actually talking with an asset manager a few weeks ago. Uh, he has two offices, one at home, one in a shared, shared office space, and he has a backup drive located at each. When he plugs in his computer uh, into his docking station, this, this hard drive is automatically connected. And the hard drive manufacturer has backup software. So any files that have changed on his computer are written to this backup drive. In that case, if his computer is hit by ransomware, any connected drives would also be impacted because they're physically connected. The ransomware can, can find that hard drive, but then the alternate, you know, if he's in his home office and gets hit by ransomware, the one that's in his work office is not going to be impacted and vice versa. So in that case, given the size of his business, given the complexity, both of which were, were relatively small, that kind of backup strategy actually makes sense. So that brings us to actually architecting and choosing some of these tools. These are tools and, and recommendations that Coalition has based on our experience. The first and most important thing that you need to do, however, is determine which services you have that provide some kind of data durability or automatic backups and which ones don't. Figuring out what you're actually trying to back up is going to be critical to choosing one of these providers. I broke them into three categories. Backups Plus is basically online backup providers that also have some additional services, Acronis, Datto, and Veeam. Datto, for example, has some ransomware prevention, ransomware detection, and automated ransomware recovery features. They basically have uh, an agent that runs on your computer. If it identifies ransomware activity, it can take some proactive measures to protect backups and to stage your recovery so that it's a little bit faster and easier. Veeam, for example, is integrated with development tools and can be used for managing cloud environments as well as the data that is stored in them. So if you're doing custom software and custom application development, Veeam might be uh, a useful tool. Of course, because they provide those functionalities, they're not, they're not cheap. If you just need basic and simple cloud backup for either business or personal use, Backblaze, Carbonite, CrashPlan, and iDrive all have features and offerings that are appropriate. If you're a very small business, a couple of folks, you might look at some of the personal backup tools as well. You might also look at these for backing up user workstations. If you're a macOS shop, Apple's built-in Time Machine is a useful backup capability. Same thing as backup and restore on Windows. If they're properly set up to backup to an external hard drive, these are both 
very useful, robust backup tools. If you have mobile devices like iOS devices, iPhones and iPads, or Android devices, you may also be able to use the built-in cloud backup tools for iOS devices, it's iCloud. And for Android, you can back those devices up to a Google account. The one key takeaway here and the one most important reason that we talk about data backups, we do see ransomware attacks that unfortunately cut people off from access to the data, to the systems that they need to run their businesses. So I do wanna leave you with this one parting thought in the event of a ransomware attack, a good quality backup is literally the difference between end of life for your business and a minor disruption where you can, as the Brits would say, keep calm and carry on. Critically important, we see this in claim after claim related to ransomware if the data backups are good. It's a minor, although disruptive event for our policyholders in the event that the data backups are inaccurate, incomplete, non-existent. It's a major disruption to the business and one that has pretty serious impacts. I know we've seen some questions here. I'm going to pause the screen sharing and see if I can open the Q&A box. Yeah, and Aaron, I can read off some of the questions for you too. Uh, we had a couple of questions about specific recommendations for providers, uh, and you know, you I know you just addressed this, but you know, SharePoint, OneDrive, Google Drive. Maybe you could talk a little bit about the any any specific recommendations or trade offs with those various options. Yeah, I think it's important to note the difference between those being backup providers versus those being SaaS applications. If you're using Office three sixty five you have SharePoint Online, that is a software as a service offering that comes with a data durability metric. So figuring out if you're storing sensitive data in SharePoint, figuring out if the data durability metric is sufficient for you to sleep at night, or if you're a little bit paranoid and wanna do that kind of maybe monthly or quarterly or even once a year backup of the data in there, it depends on how vital it is and how much you trust Microsoft. Not saying you should or shouldn't, it's ultimately a personal decision. Does your recommendation for backup options differ at all by industry? And for example, we had one person ask if there's any specific recommendations that we would have for defense or aerospace uh, related industries. Anything that touches government regulations, if the word NIST 853, CMMC, NIST 800, 171 means something special to you, or makes you want to crawl under your desk and cry, uh, chances are you have a backup requirement that comes from one of those documents. You're gonna be one of those regulated industries where you have to have a specific offsite geographically separated. So you're gonna have some very unique requirements there, which might actually require the use of your own custom backup solution or the use of a FedRAMP accredited online backup tool because you're dealing with government data as uh, as your customer in those industries, you're going to have to use stuff that has passed the government test. So I would point you to any of the backup providers that have a FedRAMP accreditation. Um, another question that came in specific to use of personal devices and, and risk for experiencing a ransomware attack. The question was specifically, if someone is using a personal device that they use something like a log me in to access their office computer, could they be subject to a ransomware attack on their personal device? Uh, that is an interesting question. I think it depends on what they're doing with the remote access. So if they copy a file, log me in does give you the ability to do that. You can do a file transfer. So obviously if they copy a, it's called malware, malicious software. If they copy the file that actually contains the ransomware virus, then yes, their personal machine could be potentially targeted in general, where you're just interacting with a remote computer using your browser. Typically not, uh, there's no data connectivity between those, you're, you're literally just getting a picture of the desktop. I saw one, Jen, I found the Q&A uh, widget, it was hiding behind the slide, so I just managed to, to open that. Saw a great question here about, do we need to keep a copy of passwords anywhere other than a password manager? I am going to unequivocally say absolutely not. Your password 
manager should be the one place that you have passwords. The way that passwords are designed for most systems, you do have the ability to reset them. If you lose access to an account, if you lose access to your, your password vault, you should be able to reset it. So that's one of those decisions you have to make when deciding whether you should back something up or if it's something that you could reconstitute or gain access to in an alternate way. So password backups to me, the value of the, the passwords, their criticality would make them such a target that I would not want to have a backup copy of that floating around. Absolutely. Uh, a couple more questions came in. One that was about any specific recommendations that we have on MDM software that would be able to back up or control company assets that are offsite. Yeah, great question. MDM, mobile device management. Uh, at this point, mobile devices are defined as anything running Windows, Mac OS, Android, iOS, uh, basically user workstations, tablets, smartphones. Most of them don't necessarily do backups themselves, but you can configure certain backups. So for example, uh, Apple MDM software lets you specify that iCloud backup either will or won't be used. You can also push a configuration that sets up uh, Mac OS computers to back up to Time Machine using an online backup service. So you can configure that through the MDM. It's a little bit more complicated because you obviously have to have the backup service. And then you also do the, con uh, but then you do the configuration through the MDM tool. Uh, same thing for, for Windows devices and for Android backing up to uh, Google accounts or backing up to a corporate, uh, corporate file server using the Windows backup and restore. We had another question and it came in about Malwarebytes specifically, which if you're not familiar with it, Malwarebytes is one of our, uh, our security partners and they provide endpoint detection and response uh, software. And the question was specifically whether they need soft, that software downloaded on computers and iOS devices or only on computers in terms of uh, EDR tracking. I know Malwarebytes has a Mac OS version, Windows and Linux. They have some products for iOS and Android devices. On iOS, the actual risk of, of viruses and issues is relatively low, just based on the way the operating system is architected. The one thing that I'm most concerned about there is actually the security of the devices themselves. Can other people gain access to them or can they be stolen because they're inherently portable. So I'd be less concerned about malware bytes on iOS devices and more about having good MDM in place to enforce things like a secure passcode, like device encryption uh, for the, the devices and then remote lock or remote wipe if a device is stolen. And then uh, one last question before we wrap up. So this individual said they received an alert from Coalition that they uh, need to apply some updates to their server. And the uh, question is specifically, how can we help in terms of providing guidance about what, up, what changes or updates they need to be making to their systems? In general, patch early, patch often. Uh, always, always considered a best practice making sure that you have appropriate systems that are still supported. Uh, so if no patches are available, it could indicate that the software you're running is what's known as end of life. Obviously don't want to, uh, don't want to be running unsupported software that is no longer receiving security updates. If there are any additional questions on that, obviously slightly off topic from, uh, from just pure uh, data backups, you can always reach out to help at Coalition Inc. and we, uh, we can schedule some time to talk either with me or with a security engineer. So if you're a policyholder, help at coalitioninc.com. Great, and I think uh, I know we're right up on time. So I think that's a great place to end it. So thank you everyone for all of the excellent questions throughout. And just to reiterate on Aaron's last point, you know, we are here to help to our broker partners, our policyholders, and you know, we've compiled our recommendations that Aaron mentioned in the beginning of the presentation on our cybersecurity guide, which you can access from this link here, coalitioninc.com 
slash cybersecurity dash guide, which we'll also be sending out through the follow up email from this presentation. And in addition to that, we are always available to help uh, again, Aaron or others from our security team. And we'll include the link for booking time with that team in the follow up email as well. So thank you everyone for joining us today and for your, your participation and I hope you have a great rest of your day.